Um, thanks very much indeed, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to come back. Now, a little trepidation. This, I was a um, registrar at this institution, learning my cardiology, and this hall holds mixed memories for me. Lots of interviews and exams were held here. Not always happy times. So this is where I work at the moment, University College Hospital, and I'm just going to uh, give you an idea of what is clinically an extremely frequent occurrence. Um, I was just saying earlier uh, to Simon that about 50% of the requests for consultation from cardiologists from our oncology colleagues uh, relates to atrial fibrillation in one form or another. The other 50% with ventricular dysfunction and of course the other 50% both. So th those are my disclosures, none relevant to this uh, particular meeting. Um, I'm just going to briefly, because I think it's important in a, in a mixed audience, going to give you a few brief words about atrial fibrillation because there's an awful lot of hype and a little bit like I was learning earlier about the treatment, who to treat and who not to treat with VTE, uh, let alone in cancer and in, in other circumstances, there is an awful lot of fear about atrial fibrillation and there's a fear that, gosh, if you don't offer anticoagulation, you are uh, missing a trick, you are uh, preventing the patient, avoiding a stroke, etc., etc. And I want to put some meat on the bones of those ideas because some of the anxiety is perhaps misplaced. So I'm going to go through these topics more or less in greater or lesser detail. But let's start. Um, you, you can say, and I think it's reasonable to say, that uh, the era of the elderly gentleman, and I consider myself one of those, I would go back again, um, listening and pontificating about what's wrong with the patient sort of began to recede when we had objective evidence of cardiovascular health and cardiovascular condition with the blessed um, ECG machine. And that all started with a guy called Wilhelm Eindhoven, um, who was working in Leiden in Holland, and he developed it in the early part of the 20th century, and he got a Nobel Prize uh, for his efforts. But being at St. Thomas's, I have to plug University College Hospital because this is where the ECG was first applied to patients. Uh, they didn't let Eindhoven use it on patients in Leiden. Um, but Thomas Lewis had no such constraints, brought it here, and I don't know why it keeps moving on, forgive me. And this is the kind of machine that he was dealing with in 1911, early electric cardiography. And this is a, a photograph I took yesterday of uh, Thomas Lewis's book, rather dishevelled, I still look at it, um, on, on my uh, shelves at, at my office at UCH. So he started that, and this is a page which I think is relevant to this. This is um, an illustration of um, atrial fibrillation. This is a book published in 1920, and he made the comment that the characteristic is that there is an irregular uh, pulsation, um, also, that it accounts for more than 50% of all cardiac irregularities. Those facts remain true today. So, let's just think about it. In the general population, the prevalence is said to be just about 1.8%, um, and it rises with age to be about 6% in the over 65-year-olds, and 12% of patients with atrial fibrillation are in this age group. And then there are all sorts of clinical classifications. I'll just throw them out because you will hear them. Paroxysmal, which is self-evident. These are self-terminating bouts, usually short duration, uh, by definition for trials, under seven days. You've then got things like persistent, um, long-standing, and permanent, which I hope are self-explanatory. Um, and there are some clinical things that you should bear in mind. Increasing prevalence with age, uh, slightly commoner in men than women, uh, slightly commoner in uh, white ethnic groups than black. And there are some familial forms, including some um, interesting uh, electrophysiologically Chinese families. And then we, we know some of the things, and then again for all physicians, knowing some of the reasons why it occurs is useful. Um, the biggest um, potential underlying pathological cause leading to atrial fibrillation in later life remains hypertension numerically. And that's probably because it's associated with your left atrium becoming dilated, becoming stretched. That alters the cells, that leads to changes in the electrophysiology of those cells so that micro-reentry circuits can occur and you can develop fibrillation. 
heart failure, uh, then this is more associated with pulmonary vein dilatation and a lot of spontaneous atrial fibrillation arises from the pulmonary veins as they enter the atrium. Hence, the success of ablation treatment which electrically isolates the vein from the atrium. And then you've got the common things like coronary disease leading to small patches of fibrosis within the heart, which again alter electricity and, and increase the propensity to fibrillation. Um, I'm not talking about valve disease today, and I'm not sure if you, I can't see, but there should be a bottom column there um, with a few other issues, including hyperthyroidism, uh, hemochromatosis, um, and then we'll go into the drugs and, and cancers in a moment. And so what does it do to you? Well, it depends who you are. But essentially, um, you've got the hemodynamic, the, the effects on the heart as a pump. Chronotropic incompetence is a very uh, complex way of defining your heart rate is very poorly controlled. It's fast when you first go into it, unless you've got a, a, another sort of um, heart block. And also, it rises excessively quickly under stimulation such as exercise or indeed fever or other, other increased demands for the heart. So not only uh, is it irregular, but the, the, the capacity to control the rate is very poor. Um, and for the patient, this may be manifest as a, a, a physical awareness of the heartbeat or palpitation. Um, it also may not feel that, but may just notice that they can no longer exert fully. Um, and of course, if you have a sick heart to stop, start with, you may pop into heart failure. The very fact that you lose the atrial contraction, which is important to get the maximum cardiac output, when you lose that, you will have a fall in cardiac output, um, averaging roughly somewhere about 10 to 15 percent, which in a normal, healthy heart, there's plenty of spare capacity, probably not noticeable. Um, However, your left atrium is dilated, not contracting, pressure rises, again, in many circumstances, not of great consequence. But if you have a stiff, stiff heart, um, many of our cancer patients have stiff hearts. If that's the case, then the propensity to precipitate pulmonary edema through rising left atrial pressure can happen very, very quickly. So someone with a stiff heart goes into AF, they can go into pulmonary edema in a matter of minutes. And, of course, you have trouble with, uh, may have trouble with coronary flow. However, the, the, the theme of this meeting is down here, and that is the propensity for an irregular pulse to lead to strokes, uh, thromboembolic events, and TIAs. And I'm going to concentrate on that. Now, this is a very early data um, showing that actually you could reduce the uh, incident of stroke if you anticoagulate. And so here is the incident of stroke in red. And as you anticoagulate, reaching an INR of 2, the stroke incidence falls and remains uh, at a low level. Um, and then you have a problem with the gray line showing the rise of intracranial hemorrhage as a complication once you get higher INR levels. And hence, the recommended therapeutic range um, which uh, has arisen out of data like that. And the cardioemboli in the context of atrial fibrillation arise in the atrium primarily, but not totally, but primarily in the left atrial appendage. And uh, all of you, um, please, and particularly you, and please put your fingers in the ears. These are because they develop red thrombi. This is a cardiologist's understanding of clotology, forgive me. And essentially, where you have red thrombi, as I understand it, um, anticoagulation is good and can prevent that problem. And I'll come back to this. A lot of problems are actually uh, your dear old white thrombi, which occur often in higher flow situations, for instance, arterial circuits. And the classic here would be um, arteriosclerotic uh, arter arterioles, particularly in the brain, leading to uh, strokes with another genesis other than red thrombi thrown off by your atrium. So interestingly, in atrial fibrillation patients, uh, and I've looked around, on average, about 60% of, um, of atrial fibrillation, um, ischemic stroke in atrial fibrillation, is due to cardiac emboli. Now, that actually, I went back and I read that a couple of times, tried to look at the original data. That means 40% aren't. 
Now that's going to be an important theme that I'm going to come back to. In non-AF, that's proportionately lower, probably somewhere nearer 20%. And don't forget that 80% of ischemic strokes occur in patients without any atrial fibrillation. So even if you got rid of all AF, you're not going to get rid of all strokes, folks. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And again, a little bit of epidemiology based on very big registry data on people over 64, 4.3 million. Um, you can judge that atrial fibrillation increases stroke by about sixfold um, for cardioembolic um, and uh, 1.4 for non-embolic strokes. And, and that was adjusted in that particular for age, sex, cardiovascular comorbidity. So it is an important issue. And you will be aware of the chads vas scores, which allow you to identify individuals at particular risk, um, and you ascribe a score to a, a, an associated comor comorbidity. And we know that you can estimate from very large studies, really, the kind of annual stroke rate. And I do use this individually with patients to help them understand, because your patient told you have atrial fibrillation, you're at risk of stroke. The patient thinks, oh, it's going to be 50-50, isn't it? I'm going to have a 50% chance of stroke. It, it, well, it is a significant, and it's certainly higher than the non-AF cohort, but it's not uh, something to, uh, you know, take your last holiday for. So I'm going to look at another little bit about atrial fibrillation and stroke risk. Um, and this is stroke embolism and TIA, and this is again a very large, very recently published Danish um, registry, three million people. Um, and 80% of ischemic strokes they know occur in people without AF, same figure again. They stated a really important and a very fundamental question. What they said is, is the component of the risk score, Chad's VASC, um, that determines your risk of stroke? Or are the components only important when you've already got AF? Now, this is important. And they looked at this big study population between 1997 and 2011. And you can see they showed in the ones age 50 at the onset of the study, stroke incidence 0.5%. And we go right the way up here, as everybody's noticed, at 80, it's 8.5% of the cohort, so rising in age. And what they found is this. This is slightly complicated, but not really. So if you look here, and this is the men, there's a similar data for women. If you look with no Chad's vast risk factors, as the group um, gets older, the risk of stroke rises. And in black are those without atrial fibrillation, and in this bluey-green color, this aquamarine, um, there's a, the risk in those with atrial fibrillation. And you can see at every point, the AF risk puts the risk up, okay? But what becomes clear when you look at this data, it goes up by a bit. It doesn't go up monumentally until you start looking at the people who've had a previous stroke or previous um, C, uh, TIA. The risk also goes up if you have one risk factor, two risk factors, or three risk factors. And at each point, having AF incrementally adds a little bit. But the fundamental point is that your risk of stroke goes up with your Chad's VAS score, and the AF bit just adds another little bit to it. So in the presence of Chad's VAS risk factors, AF is associated with a moderate increase in risk of stroke. Now, this is very important when we come to this particular group of patients where our therapy may not be benign because of their risks of hemorrhage. Um, in most cases, AF increases stroke risk less than the age increase of 10 years and equivalent to about one score on your chance VASC. Now, this is a caution. Cancer patients, can patients being treated for cancers or having cancers are not part of this score. So we use it and so we should. All right. Cancer and atrial fibrillation, they are related. It's really complicated um, because there are many reasons why so many patients develop atrial fibrillation in and around cancer. There may be direct tumor effects, but I'm not going to consider that anymore. That's pretty rare. However, there are um, the drugs, um, surgery, uh, overall inflammation, paraneoplastic, um, autonomic nervous system imbalance, um, cancer-related comorbidities, 
So there are a lot of factors that mean the cancer patient, the cancer patient under treatment is going to be more at risk. Now, the other little thing I came across doing, which I didn't know, uh, was that recent onset, and this is actually for my cardiology colleagues, recent onset AF is associated and is a marker for occult cancer. There we are. Well, that's more like it. That's at, that's at St. Thomas's. <laughs> so here we have their data, um, Scandinavia, standardized incidence ratios, and you look here between 0 to 3 months um, in the early, some presenting with atrial fibrillation, there is a very distinct um, incidence of occult cancer. So it's going to make me think differently and make me be a little bit more cautious in all the people that come through my A&E with AF and say, oh, off you go again, you know, have a, it's only a little bout of AF. That if you screen these people early, you will pick up occult cancers. I think that's an, a message not relevant to this meeting, but a, a really important point. Okay, so what, let's look. What data do we have about the occurrence of atrial fibrillation in cancer? This is recent onset cancer. That's the, the, this is a review published in the American College of Cardiology. AF in 2.4% at the outset, and then another just under 2% developed AF during their cancer. Um, there's a doubling of the thromboembolic risk. There's a hazard ratio. Is there six-fold increase in the risk of heart failure? Um, most frequently in this particular study um, was in people having a thoracic surgery, usually pulmonary resection for lung cancer. And the risk factors are ones you might recognize, advanced cancer, hypertension, or previous history of atrial fibrillation, a poor physical status, post-op tachycardia, BNP, which marks for heart failure, or difficult surgery or need for uh, blood transfusion. The list of cytotoxic chemotherapeutic agents that also seem to be able to precipitate AF is quite long, and I've given you a non-exhaustive list there. It was also recognized very early on in the experience of um, cell, uh, stem cell transplantation in the hematology world that um, atrial fibrillation was a very common um, issue. Um, so most of these were plasma cell malignancies, 27% in one study at about a fortnight, but most were in outpatients that might be an underestimate, and certainly by the number of calls I get, I suspect it is an underestimate. And again, the risk factors are the ones you imagine, old age, pre-existing diastolic or systolic dysfunction, uh, weight gain is interesting, um, the therapeutic agents and the rest. So how do you detect it? Well, this is what they do at St. Thomas's, and you'll recognize those of you in nursing that he's not bare below the elbows. So this is a better way of doing it, also using a watch. Um, but in order, once you've picked up an irregular pulse, um, you obviously do need an ECG to help you confirm the diagnosis. But one of the issues with this is that the longer you look, the more you find. And so hold to 24-hour ECGs, increased detection rate, because a lot of people have silent bursts of AF. Longer sampling intervals using, so that's the Holter, using these implantable uh, recorders. Um, and now, of course, we have this little one, which is a tiny little thing, and you, and you insert it a little bit like you do, you chip your dog. Um, you just insert it in and out patients, and that can stay in a year or more constant ECG signal, and you will pick up much more than you do uh, with standard Holter monitoring. We have been using these stick-on patches, which are, there's me modeling it, as you can see. Um, this gives you a continual 14 days of very high quality ECG, and we're finding this very, very important and useful. And I'll give you just a little anecdote. A 42-year-old man with myeloma, no cardiac amyloid, hypertensive in the past. He, I was, he was referred to me, lots of dizzy spells, felt very unwell with them, multiple 12 lead ECGs, which were normal, and actually one Holter, which was normal. And we put a little Zeo patch on him. And you can see here he is going along in sinus rhythm. These are where he pressed the button, I think, and had symptoms, and there's nothing to show. And this didn't have symptoms, but it's a burst of AF at about 170. And in that 13 days of recording, on day four, he had 11 hours of AF. Now, we wouldn't have picked that up any other way. 
Um, and it worries me that I think there's a lot of undiagnosed um, atrial fibrillation out there. So what does this do to you and what can we do about it? Um, well, uh, if we look here, this is a, a, a retrospective study again um, of cancer, large numbers, nearly 20, well, 24,000. Um, and you can see here in terms of mortality, um, the non-AF in the solid line is up here. Um, those are the big dotted line here, significantly greater mortality in those who had atrial fibrillation at baseline when the diagnosis of cancer was made. The, uh, the ones with cancer that developed during treatment, there wasn't a significant difference. And similarly, thromboembolism, not surprising, more uh, prevalent if you had AF, and heart failure more prevalent if you had any form of AF. Looking at how that correlated with CHADS VASC or CHADS score at that time, you can see that the higher the score, the greater the incidence uh, of mortality, whether new or baseline. Um, thromboembolism, again, the trend more obvious for people with baseline AF. The higher the score, the more likely you were to have a thromboembolic event, and heart failure, again, showing similar um, responses. And then I tried to look at what is the incidence of stroke in cancer. We're having a lot of AF. How much stroke? More difficult. Again, this is a, from the Far East. This is from Taiwan. 11,000 patients and multiple different sorts of cancer. They detected 15 strokes. So it's 0.137%, which to me was a bit surprising, interesting. Um, Mostly, they associate strokes with platinum-based chemotherapy and some with gemcitabine. So um, that was the interval from chemotherapy, so they're occurring mostly early with a few out to 30 days, and most after the first cycle of chemo. This was the worrying part of their data, and that is that there was a very, very high mortality in this group. And I think a bit like uh, other analogies of people with, we don't know whether it's VTE or not, um, that, that having these sort of comorbidities increases mortality very significantly. There is no mention, so we don't know how much of this is related to atrial fibrillation or um, cardioemboli. We just don't know from that data. And so what do we do? What do we do particularly when it comes to thromboembolism? Well, I mean, having read all of this, I think the principles have to be the same as they are for all atrial fibrillation patients. And the AF in cancer reflect underlying conventional cardiovascular risk factors. So I don't think they're any different in that behavior. But what is different? You would expect it to be higher. I mean, I would expect it to be higher because many cancers are prothrombogenic. Um, so far, the data is not showing that, but I don't know if it, because we haven't looked or, or what the reason might be. Um, so there's, I've just listed the cancers that have a prothrombogenic potential as well as the drugs. So the prospective data aren't available, and we have to, we have to address these issues very much on a one-to-one -one personalized basis. And dear old NICE have the algorithms that you want to, may want to follow. Um, I'll just deal it, because we do come across this every so often, and there's a hesitation amongst our oncology colleagues sometimes, that if you have severely compromising, may not be life-threatening, but severely compromising acute AF in a sick person, don't hang around, cardiovert them. Don't wait. Um, and uh, this is all very well validated. Uh, you can try pharmacological, but the difficulty of pharmacology is that virtually all the drugs we use in this context will further exacerbate the situation. They will lower the blood pressure. They take a long time to, to work. Uh, you can have someone then in ponredema, hypotensive, with drugs on board that may not wear off for quite some time. So it becomes very difficult. Whereas a short um, anesthetic or sedation and the cardioversion may well be all that's needed. Um, if the patient's not so much an extremist, but you're very keen to get them back into the normal rhythm, then using transesophageal echocardiography to guide um, DC cardioversion to make sure there's not an intraatrial thrombus makes it safer, reduces the risk of precipitating a thromboembolic event during cardioversion. 
Um, you can also use drugs in the same thing. And the drug list, you'll be pleased to hear, like most of cardiology, we don't have many drugs to play with, um, and the list is as long as two. Um, possibly there are a few other newer versions of amiodarone and a few other short-acting beta blockers you might try, but they're not generally available in this country. Uh, in terms of anticoagulation, again, it's fairly straightforward. We have a lot of data within cardiology, not necessarily prospective, not necessarily randomized, that you can cardiovert people um, using low molecular weight heparin um, for a period and reduce the risk of thromboembolism. So oops, we would um, recommend that we go down that area with low molecular weight heparins. And so with established atrial fibrillation in cancer, again, the main thing is what is that individual's risk of stroke? And apart from Chad's vas, you're going to bring in the specific cancer, uh, and you can then assess what the bleeding risk of what you're going to do is going to be in that individual. And there are algorithms around uh, essentially saying what I've just said, and you can follow those. Essentially, we use those as a guide, um, and that's certainly uh, the way we manage it at the moment, for lack of anything better. So which antithrombotic therapy? I'm not going to stand long on this. We've already heard that actually controlling INR in the context of cancer and cancer chemotherapy can be really difficult, um, and they do not necessarily do as well, and they have an increased hemorrhagic risk. There are potential benefits for considering low molecular weight heparin, and we do use, but we don't have any data yet, to um, reassure us that this is the appropriate response. It is in every other area that's been looked at, particularly in the, um, if you like, the recuperative period. Um, then it's in, We don't have data on antiplatelet agents. And to my mind, combination therapy may well be something that we need to think about, but haven't yet. The list of unresolved questions is very long and virtually anything to, to say uh, is unresolved in terms of prospective uh, trial data. And so we end up with our dear friend Donald Rumsfeld and his, uh, there are known unknowns, there are things we know that we know, there are known unknowns, that is to say, there are things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, and there are things we don't know we don't know. I think that summarizes this. <laughs> And that's where we are. This, this is the problem. That's the database, and, and that's us trying to make some sense out of it. I'll just say a couple of things. It's commonly seen in the context of cancer. We see a lot of it. Um, oops, sorry. It, according to the data, stroke appears relatively uncommon, less common than I would have thought it would have been. Risk of complications from the antithrombotic therapy is higher than in non-cancer groups. And very careful individualized decisions need to be made. We can't escape from that. Oops, sorry. And finally, the underlying risk of your patient. So an overweight, hypertensive, diabetic is probably going to need this treatment. Thankfully, in the cancer group, I can say back, well, the AF is irrelevant. You've already got them on low molecular weight heparin. Let's, let's carry on with that. Um, and if you've been listening, thank you very much. <laughs>